Christ Church. Good morning, Rustin and Sterlington, and good morning to my sisters up here. <laughs> Y'all, I know we sound crazy, but it's just the spirit of the Lord. We're just excited. We've had a great, great um, weekend, y'all. I just went on the retreat with our church family. And, um, you know, a lot of people said, I can't believe you're gonna go on the retreat and then you're gonna preach. And I have to say, I cannot imagine standing up here today not having gone on that retreat this weekend. Um, you know, what's funny is when I got to the retreat, I thought, you know, I wish I cried as much as these women. I wish I was, and then, uh, yeah, I ate my words because I pretty much cried for the past two days. And, but one of the amazing things is when they talked about one another, when they were talking about one another, they would always cry, they get so choked up. And I was like, I want that sensitivity, you know, for people. And I can say I can't even talk about them right now because I would do the same thing. Um, and it's more than just uh, sensitivity, it's, it's just love. And um, it's true sisterhood. And it's amazing. And for all of you out there, if you don't have that, I just wanna say, if you're at Christ Church, you have some of the best women in the world in your house. And they are not just my family, they are your family. And if you haven't had the opportunity to go on a retreat, I know it's hard to get in the sign up in the lottery, but sign up, you know, and God will bless it when it's your time to go. And um, it was definitely my time this weekend, even just listening to that song, Nothing Else. I think that was the story I needed to sing to God this weekend. Um, I think, you know, it's so easy to get in our rhythm, it's so easy to get in our routine, it's so easy to just sing another song. And I told my mom this last night, I said, I think, you know, I realize that I talk about Jesus a lot, but I don't talk to him enough. And um, I needed to just sit at his feet. And it was so good for me. And so anyways, I just encourage y'all to do that. And today, my message is titled, Does God Actually Keep His Promises? As Pastor Tom would say, if you're taking notes, I wish you would, uh, <laughs> you can write that down. Uh, does God really keep his promises? And you might be like, well, why are we even talking about this? Don't we all know this? Aren't we all up here saying all your promises are yes and amen? Aren't we saying that? Aren't we singing that? Aren't we believing that? But I've come to realize in my life, it is way easier to sing it than to believe it. It is way easier to stand here in church and get hyped up and believe it and say it and sing it, but then get home and be like, well, do you really, God? Because I'm looking around and I don't, I don't know if that's true. I'm looking at my own life and I don't know if that's true. Because there's certain things that have played out that I just, I'm not seeing that that's true. So if we can get real today, has anyone in here ever told an empty promise? Okay, these women are very real, but if all of you are like, we just met, I'm not gonna tell you about my empty promises. Maybe, maybe you have kids, and then you know people tell empty promises. Because I remember when my brother and I were little, uh, we used to you know, be in the back seat, and my brother was notorious for playing the game, I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you. It's like the most annoying thing ever. And I would just be like, mom, like, make him stop, make him stop. So she'd turn around, John Luke Robertson, seriously, do not touch your sister again. I'm not touching her, you know. So then he would, she'd turn around and he'd go right back at it. But this time he wouldn't say I'm not touching you. He would just very much be one inch away from my arm, acting like he's not touching me. Mom, he's doing it again. She'd turn around, John Luke, seriously. Mom, I promise I won't do it again. How many of you know that is an empty promise? How many of you know every single time we get in that car, he's not gonna touch me? Or maybe you have teenagers and maybe you've been getting a letter like this recently. Dear mom and dad, I promise if you get me a cell phone, I will not get any app you don't wanna get. I will call you every single day. This could actually be great for our relationship, really. You know, but empty promises, right? Empty promises. Or maybe you're like me and you do not have the gift of cooking in the kitchen, but you know how to call Johnny's Pizza. And you've been calling Johnny's a little bit too much lately, three times a week. And you say, y'all, I promise we are not gonna eat Johnny's for the next month. Now that is an empty promise. <laughs> and two days I'll be calling 318-396-5120. Okay, yes. I know it by heart, y'all. I know it by heart. I provide for my family. But y'all, we have, we have made some empty promises, but maybe it's bigger than that, you know? Maybe um, it's promises to God. God, if you do this for me, God, I promise I'll start going to church again. God, I promise I'll read my Bible. I promise I'll pray. Or maybe it's bigger than that. Maybe it's, God, I, I, I would never take another sip of alcohol. We'll get right back into it. 
God, I'm done with drugs. I'll never get back on that. But then we get right back into it. I'm done with that relationship. I'm definitely not going back to that relationship. I'm done with that friend group. Not gonna do that anymore on the weekends. I'm done looking at that app, but then we re-download it. It's just, we don't mean to make empty promises, but sometimes because we're hurt people, because people hurt us, because we're insecure, because we are weak, because people change, and because we change, promises seem to get broken. And I think because we have a hard time keeping promises and other people have a hard time keeping their promises, it's so hard to believe that God is really keeping his. And when you look at him and you look at the world and you're kind of measuring it up, you're like, I I just don't know God. So we're gonna read in Matthew chapter four, one through 11. And then I'm gonna pull out three reasons as to maybe why we are doubting the promises of God. But then we're gonna look at three reasons why we don't have to. So Matthew 4, one through 11 says this. Then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and he said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their glory. And he said to him, all of this I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone from me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and behold, the angels came and were ministering to him. That is a powerful text. And we're gonna draw a lot out of that. But the number one reason, the first reason, not number one, but the first reason I believe we doubt the promise keeper. Why we doubt God keeps his promises is because we don't know the promises of God. You know, when you think about it, you're sitting here and you're seeing all your promises are yes and amen, and you might have an idea of what the promises of God are, but there are hundreds of promises in the Bible. And when I started thinking about this message, I was like, could I actually legitimately sit here and name 15 of them? Like really, like scripturally say, and then, here in Isaiah and here in Psalms and here and Ephesians and here is the promise and here. I really don't know that I could. I think I kind of have an understanding of what the promises are, but I don't really know the promises. And I think because we don't know the promises, sometimes we think our expectations of God are the promises of God. And a lot of times I think that's why we get disappointed because our expectations of who God should be are not always what God's promises actually are. And there's this quote I heard before going into marriage and they said, expectation without communication results in frustration. And that is true in marriage. And that is also true with God. That when we put these great expectations of God, God is great and God can handle expectations, but when we put these false expectations of God and we don't have any communication with God, we don't know the word of God, Sometimes that ends up with frustration towards God for something that he never even promised he would do. For something that he, that's not even, that is not even his character to do. And when you would sit in the word and you'd read the word, you'd be like, wow, his promises are actually greater than what I'm even asking. Like I'm asking for just this little blessing, but he has this massive promise. And so I think sometimes we get confused by that. And you say, well, Sadie, I mean, God does want all things, all things work together for the good of those who love him. Well, that's a promise and that means that all things should be good, right? Well, look at this. So Romans 8, 28, it does say all things, we know all things work together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. But I wanna point out something, that Paul said that. Paul said that. Why is that powerful? Because Paul, in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty five, 25, it tells a little bit about his testimony, things that he's been through. And I just condense this just to name a few. It says he was beaten, he was near death several times. He was stoned, he was shipwrecked, he was lost at sea, he was in danger from robbers, rivers, people, cities, wildernesses. He had fake friends that hurt him. He had sleepless nights. He was hungry, he was thirsty, he was cold. He felt the weight of anxiety. And this dude was literally bitten by a snake. 
All of that happened to Paul. And yet he's the one saying all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And so what I wanna remind you is that just because things are bad doesn't mean God's not good. Just because circumstances are bad doesn't mean that God is not good and still faithful and still very much so keeping all of his promises. You see, in this scripture, I think sometimes we think, well, if we're doing the right thing, if we're obeying God, then we should get blessing, then we should receive promises. But Jesus is God, hello, and he's human. And he literally just got baptized and God just said to him, you are my son with whom I'm well pleased. There's no better that you can get. But then right after that, he was led led by the spirit, where? To the wilderness, to do what? To be tempted by the devil. So you can be living in the perfect will of God and still end up in the wilderness. You can be living in the perfect will of God, just like Paul, and you can have sleepless nights and you can be hungry and you can be thirsty and you can be cold and you can be all these things. But just because you are all those things does not mean that God is not good, he is not faithful, he is not a promise keeper, and he is true to his word. And when you read the promises of God and you know the promises of God, you begin to realize, oh wow, he's keeping every promise even in the wilderness with Jesus. Whenever he said, he says in the word, you will not be tempted beyond what you can bear. Jesus was tempted in many ways, but not more than he could bear. He says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The minute he said, be gone from me, Satan, the devil left. God was keeping his promises and God was with him the whole way. Psalms 23, four says this, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Notice the promises in there, that he is with us, that his rod and his staff comforts us, but what it doesn't promise is that you won't sometimes walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes you will be in wilderness situations. You will be in some scary situations, you will be in some hard situations, but friend, the promise of God is not that you won't be in those situations. The promise of God is that he will be with you in those situations and he will comfort you. So the second thing, reason I think sometimes we don't know the promises of God, the first being we don't know the promises. The second being we have an enemy who does know the promises and he manipulates the promises. So notice in this text, the first time scripture was quoted, it was Jesus, it's in red letters. The second time the scripture was quoted, it was the enemy quoting it. Now you don't really think about that often, do you? That we have an enemy who knows the scripture. And it's kind of alarming to think about that he knows it more than we do. He knows this book. He knows the promises of God. And that's scary because if you have ever played football or know anything about football, the best football players watch the most film. They know the opponent, they know the plays, they know the moves, they know everything about them and they study it and they watch it and they learn it because they're good players. And they know if the quarterback makes one right, they're going right, they know exactly what's happening. Why do they know? They wanna know because the best advantage they have is to know where he's going so that they can take him out when he gets there. And the enemy knows where you're going. Lawyers, they know each other's cases. They, know the, they wanna know everything. So if somebody brings up an argument, they're right there to bring another one. That's how the enemy works. He knows the scripture. And we shouldn't be that surprised by this because this has been going on since the very beginning. We know he's crafty. He is a lot of bad things, but he is not very stupid. He's pretty smart, actually. In Genesis chapter three, we get a picture of who this enemy is. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast in the field that the Lord knew and that he had made, sorry, that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say? There he is, questioning what God said, questioning the, do you really keep your promise, God? Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, But God said, so this is awesome because Eve knew what God said. Here's what we were saying first, but you gotta know what God said. She knew what God said. She said, you should not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch, at least you would die. So first of all, she knew the word of God. Second of all, she knew that it was a bad thing to do that. But then the serpent pushed a little further. You will not die. You won't die for God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God knowing good and evil. And if you begin to notice, there are so many similarities between this moment where 
Eve is being tempted by the enemy in the moment when the enemy is tempting Jesus. Because he has the same strategy. Why is he the same strategy? Because he has this massive lie that he wants you to believe that you can be like God. Why does he want you to believe? Because he wants to be like God. He's always wanted to be like God. So of course he's going to manipulate you to think that. But guess what? It's never worked for him. It won't work for you. Here it is. He says, you'll be like God, you'll know good and evil. Verse six, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. And she also gave it to her husband who ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So right there in that moment is when we fell. It's where sin entered the world. It's where shame entered. It's where all this stuff happened. And it only took two conversations with the enemy for her to question the word that God actually said, for her to completely forget that the tree was good and evil. After she talked to the enemy, notice that it was no longer looked bad, it no longer was something that she thought she could die from, it was no longer any way bad, it was only good. After she talked to the enemy and was convinced by the enemy, when she looked at the tree, it was desirable, it was good, it, was, it looked so good, no longer was there any evil in sight. And that's what the enemy does when he comes with you with these empty promises. Of course, he's not gonna show you the evil side. Of course, he's just gonna point out the good side to you. And that's why we get tempted. We wouldn't take an empty promise if we knew it was empty. We wouldn't take a false promise if we knew the other side of it. But culture isn't gonna show you the other side either. You see, you're gonna be watching a movie and there's gonna be this couple and they're all cute and they're having an affair. And the next thing you know, you're like, they're so cute, woohoo, I'm cheering them on. Oh my gosh, happy ending. That wasn't a happy ending. They just didn't show you the other side of it. They just didn't show you the hurt and the pain and the kids didn't show you any of that. Of course, they're not gonna show you that. You know, you're watching a commercial on TV and it's just alcohol commercial, everybody's having fun. Woohoo, party, yeah. Nobody's gonna show you the next morning. There is never gonna be an alcohol commercial of the next morning, ever. No one's gonna show you alcoholism. No one's gonna show you the evil side. It only looks good, desirable, great. This is awesome, right? What could go wrong? Is it really that bad? Did God really say? And when we're not in the word, it's easy to think, well, surely he didn't say that because he wants my good and this looks good. No, he is good. He is good. Fame looks like that too. You see fame and you say, man, if I was just famous, then I'd be loved, then I'd feel accepted, then I'd be known, then I'd have all those things. No one shows you the bad side. No one shows you the isolation. No one shows you the hate. I'm gonna show you the fear. They're not gonna show you that. They're not gonna show you that. So when you see something, you think, oh, if I just took it, then I'd have all that I want, but no friends. The enemy can only make empty promises. Notice, when he was promising to Jesus, and here in Matthew, he was saying, all this I'll give you, all this I'll give you. He's promising fame, all this I'll give you if you just bow to me. He did not have any authority to promise Jesus that because he didn't have any of that. So when the enemy's ever promising you something outside of the will of God that looks like joy and peace and love, it's empty, it's not true, because he doesn't have love and joy and peace. God does. So you can't find the things of God outside of God. And the enemy makes it look like you can, but you cannot. It's fake. Empty promises. Point number three on why I think we sometimes, you know, settle for empty promises or don't think God's a promise keeper is because we settle for the empty ones instead. It's not that we don't think that God's a promise keeper, it's just that the other ones looked better. That tree just looked better, you know? That, that drink just looked better. That person just looked better. You know, it's not that God's not good, it's just that something else was before us, it just looked better. And I wanna point out in Matthew 4, something that I think we forget about a lot is that I don't think we ever considered when we were reading Matthew 4 that Jesus would fall into temptation because really he's God, he's got this. But in this moment, he was human. Like just let that kind of sink in for a second. He was human. He was just like you and I. And what the enemy did and what the enemy tempted him and promised him was actually a pretty legitimate temptation that Jesus could have fell to. It was actually a really good offer that the enemy made when he said, all of this, all of these kingdoms, 
all of this glory I will give to you if you bow to me. Now we think about that and we're like, why would Jesus need that? You know, why? Would, but at this point, this was before his ministry was like huge. This is before he was actually gonna go and actually do what he was called, sent by the Father to do, to build the kingdom on earth. And before he goes into any of that knowing, because Jesus knew that's gonna be hard, he knows I'm gonna have to die for this. He knows the sacrifice is gonna be made and here before any of that happens, the enemy says, right here, right now, I'll give it to you. I'll give you all the kingdoms. You can build your kingdom on earth right here. Why won't you just do it right now? It'll be so much easier this way. This will be so much easier, this will be so much better. And when I started to think about it like that, that man, he was human and he actually got offered everything that he came for without the sacrifice of it. And I think that that's what the enemy does to us a lot. He'll offer you an easier way. That's not God's way. And when you look at it, you're like, well, that's not a bad offer. And you can even start to manipulate it. Well, I could use this for this or this for that, even though you know it's not God's way. And the enemy promised him all of that without the view of sacrifice. But don't we know that everything has a sacrifice? Just like what I just mentioned, all of those things that doesn't look like it has a sacrifice has a very much so hard sacrifice. But which are you willing to make? You sacrifice, do you bow to the world? Do you bow to the enemy? Or do you bow to the throne of God? Both might cause crazy circumstances to happen. Both are iffy. But one actually holds true eternal value and promises. One, even in the midst of sacrifice, you have a savior. Even in the midst of pain, you have a comforter. Even in the midst of the cold nights, you have someone to keep you warm, your spirit alive, your spirit hot and on fire for God. And so, yeah, it might seem daunting, but it is way more daunting to walk life alone than to walk life with a savior. So friends, one thing I noticed too, as I was reading, about the promises of God, is a lot of the promises um, have a lot to do with obedience. You know, there's, there's so many promises that God makes, but it'll be like, come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And we're, we just wanna be like, well, God, you promised rest and I'm tired. But right before he said, you know, if you're weary and burdened, come to me, I will give you rest. But there's also a part before that says, come to me. There's this obedience, there's this walking towards him, there's this relationship to get started with him. And there's a synonym for the word promise and it's covenant. And I just love that, that, that covenant, that, that vow together. And I thought about me and my husband and how we have this relationship and we made promises together. And I was thinking about, you know, the promises Christian and I made together. There is no way I would get married and just go into marriage and not know what those promises are and just say, yeah, I know we made some promises. Couldn't tell you a single one of them, but I know we, I know we made them. No, trust me, we know them, you know them. If a boss gives you a promise that he's gonna give you a raise, you don't forget that promise. You're waiting on that promise. If God gives you a promise, you need to know that promise because that promise is true. And when the enemy wants to attain it and make it look like it's not, it is true. But at the moment when you have the opportunity to bow to the enemy or bow to God, wait for God. Be in relationship with God, talk to God. What Jesus did here the whole time is he actually reminded himself of the promises of God. And I think that is so amazing. You might say, well, Sadie, I've never really thought of myself as bowing to the devil. You know, I, I don't really, I wouldn't have done that if I, if I, you know, would have thought about it. And I know that, I know that. The enemy's manipulative and he's crafty. But I wanna read this verse, Romans 6, 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as an obedient slave, you're a slave to the one who you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. So I wanna point that out because, yes, promise and relationship takes obedience and you're, in, you're obeying one or the other. You're obeying the enemy, you're obeying God. But look at this promise of God, Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of Christ is eternal life. And that's that promise that lasts. That's that promise that sustains. So I went up and I wrote out 20 of the promises of God just to read to y'all, to remind y'all of what the promises actually are. And you know, these are just 20 of hundreds. And I want you to really focus on the character of these promises. It says this, Psalms 48, 14, he will guide us. 
Genesis 28, 15, he is with us. Isaiah 41, 13, he will help us. Psalm 32, eight, he will advise us. Proverbs 3, 6, he will make our path straight. He will satisfy your needs. He will have compassion on you. He will love you. He will be faithful to you. He will never leave you or forsake you. He promises, if you stumble, you will not fall. You've been saved by grace. Your sins are forgiven. You are redeemed. You are cleansed from all wickedness. If the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. He said, he was beaten so that you can be whole. He was whipped so that you can be healed. He says, if you ask for wisdom, I will give of it. I am love, I am truth, I am joy. I am all of these amazing things. This is what he promises. And what I notice when I'm reading the promises of God is the promises of God are way more to do with who God is and what he can give you. See, what God promises to us is not things that he can give you. God promises himself to us. God gives you himself. And so there will be moments in your life where you're like, God, if you would just do this for me, if you would just do that for me, well, where do we get that language from? The enemy's sitting here, if you do this, then you're God. If you do this, then you're God. And we get in that habit too. If you do this, then I'll believe you're God. If you do this, then I'll believe you're God. You don't need him to do a single thing than what he's already done. A single thing than what he's already done. When he sent Jesus to come and bear the weight of your sin, and Jesus took it to the cross. He said, do you ever wonder what would have happened if Jesus would have fell to this temptation to the enemy? I mean, what would have happened? What would have happened if he would have said, deal, give it to me. I want it right here, right now. I don't wanna have to go through that death right here, right now. What would have happened? Well, we would have been right back to where we started with Adam and Eve. We did have a conversation that went like that. And we find ourselves in that place so often. And after that happened, after we fell, God's so good, God's so faithful, but it was so hard to get back to God. They had to make sacrifice after sacrifice to get to God. There was a holy temple, there was all this stuff. How can I get back to God? And then God in his mercy and in his love came to us and with Jesus became the sacrificial lamb for all of us so that we don't have to worry, how do we get back to God? Friend, if you wanna get back to God, you just turn in his direction. If you wanna get to that promise, if you wanna have that true fulfillment in life, that true promise that isn't empty, that doesn't have a next day to it, that has an eternity to it, that's found in God. There's this verse in Hebrews that used to bother me, Hebrews 11. I'm reading all about all the faithful people in the Bible. This person did this, and this person did this, and this person did that, and you're like, wow, I just wanna be like them. Heroes of faith. And there's this verse at the end of it, and it said, and none of these people got all that was promised to them. And you're like, what? What, these people? And you're like, well, really God, are you a promise keeper if they did it? But then it says, but God wasn't ashamed to be their God, for he knew that something better was coming that he was preparing for them. I love that word. A verse that used to scare me now makes my heart sing. Because I know, you know what? It might not all happen in this time. It might not happen tomorrow. But I have a God who's not ashamed to be my God because of the way that it looks, because he knows who he is and he knows what he has for us to come. He is a man and a God of good promises, y'all. He is a God of good promises. Jesus, fully God, fully man, but paid the ultimate sacrifice for us. And so friends, I... I can't help but believe there are so many of you guys in here who have just been listening to the voice of the enemy. You don't even know that it was the voice of the enemy. It looked like the voice of the world. It looked like the TV show you're watching. It looked like the friend you were listening to. It looked like the app you were watching. It looked like all these different things. But you have been led to a place that you thought was gonna bring satisfaction, but it's actually left you incredibly empty because empty promises lead to empty people. We are empty when we take those promises you're sitting here today and you're like, I don't know how I'm here, but I am all those, I'm, I'm hurt, I'm lost, I'm lonely, I'm afraid. I've tried all these things, it hasn't given me anything. Then today, I just want us to take a second to close our eyes, bow our heads, and position ourselves to get right before God. Friend, God is not mad at you. He is not um, withholding from you. He is waiting for you. He is waiting for you to say, God, I'm ready to listen to your voice. 
learn your word, meditate on your word, know your promises because God, I realize everything the world has to offer me is incredibly empty and I need a savior to bring fulfillment. Maybe you're sitting in here and that God has never been real to you. Maybe you've been watching all these women praise you and just praise God and be excited and get all this energy and you're like, I wish I had that. I can tell you a couple of days ago, a lot of these women, including myself, went in really scared, really afraid, really hurt, but we left filled because we came to know the promise keeper. We came to know God in such a real way and realize that he is so, he's more real than the things that I see because of the way that I feel on the inside. And I want you to be filled with that today. So if that's you today, with everyone's eyes closed and head bowed, I just ask that you would raise your hand. You've been listening to the words of the enemy. You've been believing the lies, the empty promises, and you're ready to find true fulfillment today. Thank you for your hands. Thank you for your heart to share. God sees you. God sees right where you're at. You can put your hand down. Maybe today is the first time in your life you're acknowledging that you need a savior. That man, nothing can save my eternal soul but Jesus Christ. If I keep believing these empty promises, I'm gonna go to the grave an empty man. But if I today put my faith in Jesus, I will go to the grave with the promise of an eternal home and that eternity starts today. Then I just ask that you would be so bold to raise your hand. If that's you today, coming home to your savior. Praise God. I'm gonna pray over us today, but before I do, well, I'll pray over us and then I wanna give you an encouraging word to leave. God, I thank you so much for how good you are. I thank you for how holy that you are, God, that in a world where we can be so tempted by an enemy who has empty promises and false promises that we also have a savior that has eternal good promises for us. God, I thank you that the minute someone turns and repents of their sins and turns to you, that they are alive in Christ Jesus, that those promises I read are true, who the Son sets free is now free indeed. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So no matter what they came in here holding, what they came in here holding them back, today they are set free by the blood of the Lamb. God, I pray over these people, God, that they would seek out baptism, that they would seek out burying that old self and coming alive in the new God, that symbolic message that the old is gone and the new has come. Would we anchor our hope in that, that you have clothed us in a new self? I thank you for every person in this room. I pray that people would have the boldness to deny the enemy, the boldness to say no to the lies of the enemy speaking the love for the word like Jesus, when the enemy says something, we have something to come back. And that we'd be willing to hang longer than Eve, not just two conversations with the enemy, until the enemy leaves, we can quote the word over our circumstances and over our life. I thank you, God, for your hope. I thank you for your love. It's in your name we pray, amen. And before we leave, I gotta leave y'all with three ways to combat this. Number one, if we are going to truly know the promises of God, then we have to trust that his promises are better than our expectations. I encourage you the next week, write out some of those things that your expectations were of God. Maybe it's, I really thought God, you were gonna get me that promotion, but even if I don't get that promotion, you're still good. God, I really thought that I was gonna be in this relationship, I was gonna be married by now, but God, even though I'm not married right now, you are enough because you are my love. Whatever it is, whatever those expectations are, write them out and then cover it with the truth of who God is. Number two, if we have an enemy that knows the word, we have to know the word. So this week, get in your word. Ask God to help you fall more in love with his word and you will. Psalms 1, 2, and 3 says, for those who meditate on the law will be like a tree planted by a stream of living water whose leaves will never wither, whose fruit will never die off. You wanna be like that tree that's planted? How, you, you think, how could I even do that? How could I be that planted in every season where I'm always fruit from always this? You get by a stream of living water. 
You meditate on the word. And number three, you need to know this without a shadow of a doubt so that when the enemy comes and tempts you and it looks all good and all desirable, that God's eternal promises are better than the temporary ones. So much better. To Christ Church, I love you. I'm so thankful for you guys. And I wanna say it again and reiterate it. If you feel lonely in this church, there is no reason for that. Come find a sister, come find an elder, come find a friend, talk to a pastor, talk to God, because this is a family. I love you, Christ Church. Did y'all receive the word of God today?